think my fans have given you a very good welcome somehow or other. Your fans have such <laughs> terrific taste. Uh, they do, don't they? I know. Full, full to the brim today. Anyway, it's lovely to see you. It really, really is. Nice to see you and welcome back. Thank you very much. I was just thinking, this is the first time in person you've seen our house. This is where we are every day. Yes, our humble well, abode. No, I've never seen it in person. No, it looks very, very nice. <laughs> I mean, it looks nicer than my house does. Yours is like a heap of rubble at the moment. Well, not quite, but a bit of like a no, building well, site. The, the word tips brings to mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I'm having it redone right throughout, and I don't know whether it's the right decision to have made to actually do everything all at one time. Because usually what you do is one room, don't you? And then you wait a bit, then you do another room. By the time you get to the end, the first room looks really old and horrible, so you start again. <laughs> so this time I'm doing the whole thing right through, but it means I'm living there with rubble and builder's dust, and it's... Uh, <laughs> would any of the fans have them to stay just for a week or two? Yeah! So you're, I might you're... take you up on it, I tell you. <laughs> so it's like a tent in the back garden at the moment, is it? No, we've, there's a couple of bedrooms that are still okay. And a couple of rooms downstairs, they, they, they've left downstairs, and the kitchen uh, has no floorboards or anything like that in it. <laughs> and it's just a matter of waiting for, by the end of next week, there'll be two more bedrooms done. So we can start moving into other bedrooms while they do the other. So it's, it's got a plan behind it, but at the moment it feels like it's never going to be done. <laughs> and you're the clock of works in the meantime. <laughs> oh, I cracked the whip. Yes. <laughs> Build another wall today. Build another wall up, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, what I want to explain is the fact that Cliff is going to be with us right throughout the show today. And later on, in our special competition, there's going to be a chance, wait for the U's and the R's, to win Cliff's latest album before it even hits the shop. When is it hitting the shops? It's going to be released on October the 19th, but there'll be a single out before that, of course. That's usually the plan of attack. You know, End of this month, there'll be a first single, and then the album will follow halfway through October. Well, we have everything hot off the press, and we also have a whole bunch of personally signed goodies. So I want you to stay with us right throughout the programme. Now, also today, we'll be finding out if the family who attempted to recreate Cliff's hit movie, Summer Holiday, are really the full ticket. We're all going on a summer holiday. summer holiday. No more work before I, That's very good. I have to tell you, before this program started, they all signed congratulations to me, which was wonderful. I said I did know a guy who could sing it just marginally better, but there you go. We're also going to be seeing today if our bachelor boy here is any use in the kitchen, because he's going to be helping out today's very special chef. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And we'll come face to face with the subject of cosmetic surgery. Now, with Cliff actually here, on the show today. We love it, don't love, we? We yes. love it. But we're going to give you the unique opportunity to talk to Cliff live on the programme today. So if you've got any question or questions that you're dying to ask, the number to ring is, as always, 0171 691 5000. So I want you to get dialing 0171 691 5000, as if I would have to tote for business on a day like today. <laughs> but first, over the last few months in the kitchen, as you know, we've had many great chefs and excellent cooks. Everything is going to go downhill as from today because our team on my first day back have decided that because Cliff has cooked me the odd sandwich or two on a number of occasions, <laughs> it's my turn to sort of slip into the pinny and get my hands dirty. So do you want to come to the kitchen? Yes. Bert Bergenjohn. <laughs> Off all your clothes, not just yet. Well, I better put my glasses on. Oh, yeah. Well, well that's good because you'll be safe. I've got yep. to strip. I've got to take my rings but off. But what a treat, though. The last time I made anything like this, I always reckon if you can read, you can cook. So I read my bet. way through it. But you have to cut everything up yourself. But here on television, it's all done. Now, listen, you see, they should have had all this. But that's last, isn't it? I don't know. You can't get the staff these days, can you? You no. get them to cut a few bits out. Let me take that here. Got to get the oil in the pan here, Cliff. Where's the oil? Door. Actually, you, you have your own olive oil, don't you? Well, no, I don't Are have my own olive oil, this? but I am hoping... Do I put all of this in? How do we, how do we get this thing to... <laughs> we haven't in. even got a glitch. No, I'll put it all in. Here we go. That's terrific. We have to get this in. Oh, this dear. It's going to be fun. Haircut and singe, now, anybody? <laughs> The idea is that we are going to make Cliff's favourite food, one, one of your favourite meals anyway. Yeah, it's a bourguignon, and it was made by a friend of mine. Did you see Heathcliff? Yes! yes. yes. Daryl, who played Edgar, that yes. nasty little blonde bloke, who actually... <laughs> it, well, anyway, uh, he, actually, he actually invited a number of us around, and he did a bourguignon, and I got him to fax me the, um, the recipe. And so, uh, yes, that goes in. Don't no, no, you've got to put it in the flour first. No, no, the meat goes first. No, no, you've got to coat it in oh, the flour dear. first. Here we go. Come on, put it in. So anyway, while Cliff is putting um, the meat oh. <laughs> and coating it all with flour... Burger, anybody? In the meantime, our olive oil is heating up. This is not Cliff's own olive oil, but you do grow it. I mean, you no, well, I'm going thing. to grow 
I've got a vineyard planted, and so therefore, hopefully very soon, I'll have wine. And if the wine is successful, I've also got olives growing there, so I thought I might be able to maybe do some olive oil as well, which would be nice, wouldn't it? In the meantime, we have somebody else's olive oil and cheap old plonk. For I know, why not? <laughs> well, it, they all work, you know. So we're going to put this into the pan, first of all, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And God, this is much more difficult than it looks, doesn't it, trying okay, to get we'll that? just put it in <laughs> Okay, here we go. Fine. All right. Fine. Is it going to sizzle them? Should do. Marvellous. <laughs> do you think this is ever going to turn out right? <laughs> yes, it will. I know. It will, it We will. might have too much flour, but you know, we like flour, is don't it? we? <laughs> oh. It's only half oh, on. Hot, it? it could get hotter, couldn't it, really? This could take the whole programme, you realise. <laughs> now, the idea is that yeah. we'd stir all this and coat it all and it should be sizzling. If we had had a, a person, they could have had this gas going, couldn't they? And had a what? Well, they could have had the gas going and everything. Oh, I know, up. yeah, but, you know, television is like that. I know. They're just not helpful at all. Do you think it's Brian? Or... And I've only been here today, but this crew are rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now you have to pretend, OK? We have to pretend that this is Brian. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> we haven't got all day. No, when I last made this call, I have okay. to say, it did take 24 hours. Um, well, that's right. <laughs> But we have to marinate. You're supposed to marinate it for 24 hours. Then that's right. Well, you, can wait, it right? you could do it, could you? This looks the most awful mess, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, pour it on. Lovely. Right. Now keep the juice. Do I turn that off or leave no, it on a no, bit? No, because they've got to do all okay. this other stuff. Because we're going to put the onions in. The shallots. Yes. Shallots in. Yeah, shallots that's shallot. In. And our lardon. La lardon. Yes, our lardon. I know it's bacon, actually. Okay. Well, it is, absolutely. What about the onions? They, they then could somebody come in and just get this other thing going? Oh, there you go. You've oh, got it going. Is. That's going there. So, hang on, why don't you turn that one off? Which one's that? This one. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. You can see that I'm not this is the last one. <laughs> no, well, I mean, anyway, you've been, you've been away, so what you? we're going to do... Now that you're married, you're going to have to let cook. this, yeah. <laughs> what did you say? I missed it. I said... I said, now that you're married, you'll have to learn to cook. I will have to learn. Or else you'll have to come and cook for us. Mind you, Stephen's easy. He eats anything. Stephen is, he is. He eats anything at all. And also, he's a very good cook, just as well, by the look of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we do this now. We can put a little bit of mustard. It gives well, it a bit okay? of a zing. It does. Yeah, it really Shall does. Shall I just put that in? Yes, that's So you're really... with us now, are you? We've that's, had the large oil. We've had the up. That's, okay, that is that's zing. That's kind of Indian now. We do all of that. <laughs> so we've got the garlic, got the onions, got it all in. Now, you, yep. you can do the wine, yes? Well, wine. I don't go too careful with wine. <laughs> oh, put but there again, I, in. shall I? Yeah, no. I All think right. you quite like excess, we don't do you, actually, really, when it comes this to This bourguignon is served in glasses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can add a little bit of orange, which gives it a little bit of tang. Another little zest. In anyway. The only thing I have to say is that when I you made mine, I do cheat a lot, you know. And they make all these different powdered things you can buy. But a friend of mine from Germany sends me... German gravy powder. I've no idea what it's called. It's... I wish we'd had it today. <laughs> <laughs> I wish and we I had always, your friend as well. I always use it because it, it makes everything so rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mushrooms are going in. We actually we have got all the ingredients and we've done it we all. Have, we've done it all right. Well, right but see, order, all this but... really ideally should have been left for a long, long time. Of course but, it should, but we have to I'd... tell everybody that we've missed it. What we about those? Little onions, they've got to go in, haven't they? Marge, you like, you like food, though, don't you? Eat I one do. Once a day. And the other thing is, when I read the recipe, if I... Well, I, I have one meal a day, but it's usually a good big one. one. Yeah. yeah, it's a big one. It starts in the morning, finishes it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to sort of do a bit of the clearing up. Well, you've got to clear up, OK. You should actually have some, and they say that a good chef washes up as they go along. But I'll wash up later. All right. Because the ants who did the hob is terrible, and uh, it's an awful mess. I know. Now, all... listen, just to recap on all of this, so you have your beef, the shallots. Yes. A um, little bit of garlic, a little put bit all of those orange, yeah. um, mustard. Sorry. Yeah. Do you put anything else in yours? Well, I usually add, if it says two onions, I put four or five. Do you? Yeah, like always. Like the wine, it says... Like the wine, if it says half a bottle, put the whole lot in. OK, <laughs> here we go. This is... Oh, well, I've been dying to say it. Am I going to say it? Yeah. This is one we did earlier. <laughs> Isn't he handy in the kitchen, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> is that heat proof? Oh, it must oh, be heat proof. <laughs> Somebody else is from my kitchen. Oh, no, right. yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Wow! There you go! Oh, Now, this is what I'm looking for. Okay. A little bit into the bowl. Alrighty, here we go. You do that while Look at that. Actually, it this smells off. fabulous. No. Listen, we can feed 5,000 here at least this afternoon. <laughs> Doesn't that look good? Looks fantastic. And served with pom. Alamette. 
<laughs> You're it's posh. A, I know. Well, it's <laughs> chips, really. But you can have a dip. Anyway, I think it's gorgeous, and we will feed the audience. Would you like some? Yes! yes. Marvellous. Thank you You'll never much. leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> what about a round of applause for the chef? <laughs> yeah. Marvellous. Now, listen, the thing is... Cliff and I have had this running gag for ages. When I was doing Radio 2 year after year, we used to say, when it comes to cosmetic surgery, and we love the idea. We do, we do. We thought that we would go in together, sit side by side in the bed, and sort of compare notes <laughs> about what we had done. Anyway, as you know, thousands of men and women undergo cosmetic surgery every year in an attempt to stave off the aging process and keep all those wrinkles at bay. But here to show us how it can actually help people keep young and beautiful is cosmetic surgeon Dr. Roberto Veal, and joining him is our own doctor in the program, Trisha McNair. Have you met? Trisha, I think you're very brave. Foolish. I think the word is foolish. Because you, you've agreed to be our sort of guinea pig today in that sense. Yes. So, and Roberto has been analysing. Well, actually, you've been analysing, uh, uh, Trisha, yeah. but we've also done a computer readout. Let me just ask you, first of all, about cosmetic surgery and the attitude to it these days, because it's loosened mm. a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, the attitude is improving a lot. More, more people, men and women, are approaching cosmetic surgery and becomes a, a subject uh, of discussion when you go out at parties because it's something that is in everyday life. So it's something like uh, almost cooking. Everybody talks about that, and they want to be informed and to want to know. I hope you're better at your job than we are. <laughs> <laughs> cooking, I mean. I think everyone would yeah. just be talking about it cooking, not actually yeah. eating yeah. it. But, but I, I always think that, at least I assume, that one has to analyze, if you're a doctor, the reason why people want cosmetic. Yeah. It's like purely vanity, or is it a more mm. psychological thing? But basically, I may say it is more psychological, because they want to improve the quality of life. And nowadays, medicine is improving the quality of life. And cosmetic surgery is one of the best aspects, because it's improving your look, then you can improve your inside and you will have a better mm. attitude towards uh, other people. So you improve your quality of life. Mm. And that's what uh, cosmetic surgery is, improving your quality of life to improving your look. I'd be absolutely honest, I'd love to have it done. Oh, so would I. Are you free? <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> I'd be worried about the pain, though. The thing that I'd really like to know is about the pain. I mean, is it just discomfort that you feel? I mean, let's take a, I'd like to have all of this sort of pinned back, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would you do? Cut around the ears or what? Yeah, the incisions for a facelift basically runs inside the here, in the tragus here, then they run behind and in this region. So basically are not uh, very visible because they're concealed. And uh, people may think it can be painful, but it's not so painful. There is some discomfort. You should expect it to feel something because, of course, you're not going to go to the hairdresser, you're going to have a, yeah. a kind of surgery, so expect something. So if you're expecting worse and then you will have less, then you will say it's not painful. So it's important to inform the patient exactly what should expect. So the discomfort lasts for, what, a uh, couple of weeks? A couple of days. A couple of days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds better all yeah, the time, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Because the anesthetic, uh, the, the anesthesia that we give, the local anesthetic that we give to the patient has improved and uh, can uh, really flatten the, the pain threshold, so you really have uh, more comfort after the surgery. Now, I see Trisha takes a nice middle road with mm. us on the programme all the time. As a GP, what's your attitude to it generally? Uh, well, I'm, I'm fairly open to it, quite positive about it, but I think you have to go in with your eyes open. So Roberta's painting a very positive picture here. There are undoubtedly some risks, and you have to find out about those and be aware of them. Risks that of, of complications like infection or yeah. bleeding or whatever. Risks that it's not going to turn out quite how you expected. And risks that uh, risk to your purse, to oh. say the least. It can be very expensive. So I think as long as you go in aware of those first of all and uh, being just being a bit cautious about who you exactly. see and whose advice you take then I'm not totally against it because you touch an important aspect we have to inform well the patient the patient is to be well informed of what is going to happen and not have unreal exactly. expectations that's the main key if you inform well the patient the patient will that's be happy true. And that's the key of success. Well, the way we thought we'd do this today, I mean, Trish is very kind in allowing us to take a before photograph, as she was yeah. in the programme uh, last My week. Um, are we going to see Patricia first of all? Ooh. Yes, this is Trish, and we think she looks lovely. <laughs> we do. Now, we did the computer readout, and this is what the computer said. So, Trisha, what do you think? Um, hmm. 
just pretty ugly all the way. <laughs> Your <laughs> choice. <laughs> pretty ugly all the way. <laughs> no, it no, it definitely was a little. Well, it's, it's it's a bit because it's a computer thing. It's yeah. a bit unreal. In yeah. other words, what they've done is is removed all sign of anything, so that you, it's almost like. Uh, it's not like when you have a photograph taken. I don't know how they mm. do it with me. They remove everything in these photographs. I don't mean they rub <laughs> it out afterwards, but by cunning lighting, they can make you look completely creaseless. It did look slightly it, unreal. It did look younger. I mean, I must yeah. admit, it definitely looked. Yeah, it's eyes. Looked, it looked it, younger. I think it looked younger. It just yeah, looked yeah. smoothed out. Now, the thing about right. I'm assuming that an actual operation, an actual facelift. Mm. So, Roberto, what, what would you do? Because you've obviously analysed her. Yes, you? because uh, analysing Patricia's face, I can see that uh, she's young and she doesn't need anything too aggressive. She needs something to refresh her skin, to refresh her look without being too aggressive. In fact, what I can, I can see in her face that she may benefit, for example, are little things that will improve. And basically, may I touch your face? You may indeed. <laughs> basically, you see, to improve these lines here. And these lines can be improved. Yes, no, I have to admit, I, I, yeah, I could go along with that one. What, on the collagen yeah. or something? No, also injecting botulinum, botox, that will stretch the muscle and will stretch also the forehead. Is that permanent? Yes, semi-permanent. It has to be repeated Completely. about uh, three times and then will improve the lines also the forehead. Yes, that's a good point. It's, and a lot of these things aren't permanent, but you have yeah. to have them. And then... The thing, sorry, go yes. on. Then what I would like to do in her face, for example, is uh, to remove the excess of the skin in the upper eyelid. And so... Uh, the, the, the eye will look more open, will look more fresh, more rested. But isn't the reality, though, I guess, if you look at anybody's face, of course, all, so. almost irrespective of age, you'll always find something. It's like I sort of thought I could get one of those brow things, you know, where you sort of lift yeah. the brow up a bit? <laughs> but without <laughs> changing your expression. <laughs> Pardon? Without changing your expression. That's the, I would be That's terrified that my face, you know, exactly. I'd like it to be younger It's to be natural. The, the yeah. best result, in my point of view, yes. is a natural result. But, there, but a lot of these things, there are other ways of achieving. I mean, just some good sleep, yeah. actually, would, would help yes, and make me look a bit enough. more refreshed. <laughs> so if you want to have us over the base, Exactly. I, good sleep. I, I think things happen to us anyway as we get older. Our faces do fall off. I mean, I'm dreading the day when you wake up and it's lying beside you on the pillow. <laughs> <laughs> so there are things. And I, yes. I, my friends say, oh, you can't have, you don't need anything done. I think, well, if I had a wart growing here with a big hair sticking out of it, I'd remove it. Yes. In the same way, if nature has, has allowed everything to drop, why not lift it up? Yeah, but you, yeah, but you see, it's quite amazing. And, you know, don't want to flatter you too much here because um, you might blush too much. But, I mean, it is amazing that, you know, Cliff, for me, has hardly changed at all. So you're, you, by looking after your skin, because I know you take vitamins and put oh, cream yeah. on and do all Oh, sort yeah, of somebody from the BBC or television or anywhere to... recommends a, a, a formula, I buy a gallon. It's good that you take care of your skin. <laughs> they took care of your look, in fact, also in, in, in mm. Tricia. In their case, for example, if we do a skin rejuvenation with a, with a peel, like a colexoderm, that is a non-surgical facelift, as a peel, we will rejuvenate a skin. And that's the main aspect in a facial rejuvenation. So it's not only pulling, it's also to refresh the skin. Yeah. I think we just have a very brief summing up here of exactly what you could have done, what it would cost. See a line reduction there that um, we were talking about, Patricia. A transplant, I think I've got to now. That was quite, that was quite yeah. reasonable there, 200 pounds, wasn't it? Type of function to me. Well, I don't know. You will, you will please note that I have not said to Roberta what he would do with either Cliff or myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd be all right. I'd be here for the rest of the yeah. day. He'd be saying, well, we'll do this and we do that. What's a fat transplant? Yes, exactly. Fat what it transplanted. <laughs> yeah, because fat is one of the best filler material that we have because it's your own fat, is a part of your body, there is no risk of rejection. But of course, with fat, you build up little by little with a few injections of fat in, in about six or seven weeks. You build up, for example, the structure of your face. We can give back the volume in the cheek oh. area. We can fill up these lines. Well, and on that note, and mm. we're going to leave it, but you've given us a lot of ideas, Roberto. Thank you very much, okay. and particularly to Trish. Thank you for being here. After the break, the family whose holiday on the double-decker bus came to an abrupt stop, and I'll get Cliff onto the sofa again, but just for a chat. You do understand. Thank you. We'll see you right after this. <laughs> Hello again. Now it's still to come an open house. We're trying to keep the audience just like sort of under wraps here. We'll be meeting the family who nearly went on a busman's holiday and the special open line to our star guest, Sir Cliff Richard. We can always be guaranteed in the chair. Hello. 
<laughs> it's first come, first serve today. The lines are already buzzing, but uh, if there is something that you've always wanted to know about Cliff, well, the number to call is 0171 691 5000. But before you get a chance to talk to him, I've got a few little questions of my own. I wanted to just point this out, because apart from being one of the world's most successful recording artists, selling records in countries as far apart as Chile and Japan, he has also starred in some of the most famous British films of the 60s. Meanwhile, he's also enjoyed, as you well know, sell-out success in the West End musical Heathcliff. And this year, he celebrates his 40th anniversary in show business. And it's worth remembering that he had hit number one spanning five decades. And it appears that the Peter Pan of pop is very much in flight. <laughs> Actually, Thank you. What is it? 250... Two hundred and fifty million records sales. Yes, over forty years, of course. That's a lot. Wasn't just last week. I know it's a lot. <laughs> yes, but also for five decades. I mean, very few people have had number one hits in five decades. No, in, in a way, it's a slightly fake statistic. It's true, though, because my first number one was in 1959, so I made the 50s. Then I had number ones in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then I think 90 or 91, Saviour's Day was number one. So I crept in at the end of the 50s and right at the beginning of the 90s. So even if I never have another number one till 2000, uh, it's still true to say that five decades I've had number one. So it's a slightly fake statistic, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think of five decades and also the way the image has changed uh, over the years, what I like about it all is the fact that you manage to keep up to date with the kids, you know, the kids that are in the charts at the moment. You move with the music and you move with appearance as well. I mean, first of all, let's take the appearance. Do you decide I'm going to change my image, I'm going to cut my hair or do something? Um, no, nothing's been too conscious. I mean, obviously you are even if you're not aware of actually being affected by designers or the way people look, you do see, see people all around you and so therefore you are affected. What I've tended to do in the past is slightly perverse of me. I go in and have, say, photographs taken for the record company and um, as soon as it's over I go and have a haircut so I don't then look like my pictures. Uh, in the case of having my hair cut shorter this time, when we were in Portugal, they, they said, we'll take some new pictures of you. How about a new image? And I said, well, I was going to shave my head to about half inch this year before going on holiday. Right. And if it looked horrible, I could wear a baseball cap or something <laughs> until it grew out. And they said, well, we needn't go quite as extreme as that, but we'd like to cut it shorter. So they cut it shorter for me. And I, I liked the look of it. I thought, it's fine. But it wasn't a conscious effort to look like somebody else, although somebody said I did look like George Clooney. Or the haircuts, George, George Clooney. Clooney. Mm. But, but do, do you do the same musically? Do you say to yourself, okay, now I really want to keep up to date with things, and do you pace yourself that way? Well, to an extent I do. I can't change the way I sound. None of us really can. Uh, I try to use my voice in, in as many diverse ways as I can, using a lot of breath, not as much breath, harden it off when I can. Um, mostly you keep up with what's happening because of technology. You know, you can play... Um, a record by any artist today and play my new album for instance and it would be compatible you'd either prefer it or not probably prefer it but <laughs> but you know what I mean? it's compatible and it's the technology that keeps you up and and I, that's what's helped me and i've worked with very contemporary producers this new guy peter wolf has spent 11 years in the states knows all these wonderful uh musicians and singers and phones james ingram and says james can you get say to williams we want a backing vocal track done and flies over well i mean it's wonderful, and how could you not be able to remain contemporary with that kind of treatment? But I noticed with the new album, you, you've gone uh, quite, quite falsetto in a lot of the tracks. Yes, the, the tracks were interesting in that producers tried to make you sing beyond your range. Um, the only producer I, I can remember, really, who didn't do that to me was uh, Alan Tarney. Always believed in the singer singing well within the range. It means that when you're within your range, every now and then you can go, ah, and it's a surprise. But with Peter, he kept saying, I'm sure we could do it at this key. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out when we get to the session. And sure enough, there were songs where I'd sing, It was three o'clock in the afternoon. Because I, I couldn't go, it was three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a look from the new video, actually, because this is a short extract, just to give you the flavor. Here okay. we go to Portugal. <laughs> is that the new single? Yes. That's, that's going to be the thing. Thank you. Well, sounds World like the, well it, it sounds like we made a good choice. That's going to be the first single. Good. And it's really funny when I was recording that. Sometimes, well, most times you have to record the song over and over and over again over a period of maybe two, three hours, sometimes four hours. And with that one, Peter Wolf, the producer, liked the sound of the breathiness. I just got to... 
And well, after about two and a half hours, I said to him, Peter, I've never had this happen, but I think I'm going to faint. <laughs> I said, I need to get some fresh air. And I'd hyperventilated, <gasps> taking big breaths of air and singing like that for ages. But fortunately, live, I've only got to do it once, so it won't happen to me. But, uh, mm. th and also in that song, I could have sung it in full chest voice, but the effect was so nice on the demo. Um, the guy that wrote it, uh, I mean, sang a wonderful demo. I'm always really, I'm, I can't believe that these people give me these songs because when I hear the demos, they sound like hits by them. If they released them, they'd be hits. And then you think, what am I going to do with it? Well, yeah, but then I think, well, I don't mind. Yeah, I'll do anything to sing a song like that. But uh, what I mean is they could have had hits with it. Mm. I mean, I, why did they give it to me? I mean, I'm really happy that they do. Because but... you're going to have the hit with it. That's well, right. That's Actually, just, just, just very briefly, I, I noticed in the press recently um, there was talk about Bill, your, your business partner and a mentor in many respects, the fact that he has a new relationship in his life and, and the fact that, you know, it might alter things for you in terms of, yeah, you well, say, your domestic scene. Yeah, it will really. It's interesting about houses and homes, I suppose. But um, I've never lived on my own. I've always had, I mean, Bill and his mother and then uh, you're coming. They're, <laughs> they're all clearing up here. Well, look, but I'm, in actual fact, we don't know. No, Bill doesn't know. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, whether he will or will not get married, but it's on the cards, and I'm thinking to myself, well, obviously he'll move out, and I'll be on my own, and I'm, it's now I'm looking forward to I mean, I'm not looking forward to it, Bill, sorry, no. What I mean is, what, what I mean is, it's like an, certainly it would be an adventure for him, and it would also be an adventure for me in a way. I, I've, you know, I would quite like to run around in my underpants without having to bother about, <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of people trying to hop in the car and go home with you today, actually. Yes. <laughs> but it's not a prospect that frightens you in that respect. No, that it doesn't. Respect, no. No. I mean, I should never be alone. I've got a lot of terrific friends and um, great support on it. You know, so, you know, I, I, whatever happens, I'll, I shall roll with it. Well, for the moment, yes. Thank you. Will you thank Cliff for me very much? with a quite incredible story of the Bullen family who, inspired by Cliff's film Summer Holiday, decided that a tour of Europe in a double-decker bus would be just the ticket. But going to where the sun shines brightly was not an easy route. To find out why, let's get on board with the Bullens. Do you want to come with you, Cliff? Let's go there. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you all. Very nice to see you indeed. And maybe you introduce me to the children very quickly. This is Gabriella, Nicholas and Natasha. And we've got Bill and Christina. So thank you very much for coming. Now very, very briefly, just go back on this story about why a double-decker bus. Um, well, it just seemed like a really good idea. I mean, when the film first came out, I guess it had a big impact. I think I first saw it back in the 70s. And uh, it's just been a super idea. And Christina, was it a super idea to you to convert this bus and go on holiday in it? Well, the bus was actually already converted. Uh, at first, the idea seemed pretty ridiculous. I thought uh, it would be a better idea to put money into buying somewhere to live. Um, but <laughs> Bill has always had this extra um, sort of, uh, eccentric Englishman streak in him, dying to get out. And I think it finally got the better of him and I conceded. And well, we have some film of the bus, which I think has converted really well. Let's have a little look. Because you've got bedrooms and toilets and everything, isn't it good? Yeah. So this is obviously your, your living space. And so this converts what into two single beds and a double? Yeah. Kitchen, toilet. This is all on the bottom deck. Yeah. Deep bed. What do you think? That's pretty good. Well, I think it looks fantastic, actually. Uh, the one we used for the film, of course, was a total fake. I mean, they did it wonderfully, but nothing was really practical. I never. I mean, all that cooking stuff, the, the hob and all that worked, did it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, it, I mean, it's amazing that they can do that. Trouble is, there is an end to this story. Well, and I don't know what she's going to tell. Because you were heading off on your holiday, you're going to have this wonderful time abroad, and Christina... And then just outside Portsmouth, the bus broke down. Oh. We weren't actually with Bill at the time because we were following by car, because the idea was that we'd leave the bus in northern Spain, and then I would travel back with the children and my sister by car, and Bill was going to come home earlier by train. But uh, the engine so blew up just the outside. The engine blew up. Oh, oh, no. oh, oh, oh. So you didn't even get to the boat? No, we didn't. About, it was about a mile short of Portsmouth that the engine blew up. So, so you didn't get it repaired at all? You didn't actually have the holiday on the bus? No, not yet. It's being repaired at the moment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah, what an awful end to the story. How did you feel after all this effort and planning and going on the bus? Um, well, I think I was really disappointed. I was disappointed more for the children than anything because um, they were really looking forward to it. Nicholas here keeps going on about Nicholas, it. Nicholas, did you drive the bus, Nicholas? No. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you kids disappointed then? 
Yeah. No. Fair. But you had your holiday anyway with Mum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you weren't disappointed. No. We had started changing the words to the song. We're not going on oh, no. summer holiday. Yeah. No more work. Lots of working. You've got any presents though, just to give. Oh, I have. Children. Look, you know, just to remember, remember your holiday that you didn't have. Oh, Thank lovely. You. I signed Thank it on the top. Much. Right oh, here it comes. A signed bus. Ding ding. There you go. And, and will you take the bus out again and attempt it once more? Yeah, we're going to take it out in probably next Easter. Okay. Well, we wish you the best of luck for the next time. Thank you Thank all you very, very much, much for coming in. <laughs> well, the idea was very good, and let's hope that the Bullens make it next time around. And after the break, we get wired for sound when Cliff not only takes your telephone calls, but also gives us an exclusive performance from his brand new album. And there are... <laughs> and also all those fab prizes are up for grabs in our special competition, so we'll see you very soon. Well, welcome back to a very special open house for us along with Sir Cliff Richard and later on Cliff's going to be performing the title track from his brand new album for us. But first, we asked if you had a question for Cliff to give us a call and as you can imagine the lines have been jammed. Just a few people we're going to be able to feature today. So here now to talk to those lucky callers is none other than Cliff. Welcome back. I've decided that actually Hilary Casemore is in Scarborough and Hilary decided that Cliff was probably a TV presenter in his former life because he just slips into them very easily. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, you've got a bit of a squeal on your line. Oh dear. Uh, far ahead of your question anyway. Yes. Um, hello, Cliff. Hi. Could you tell me what your most precious possession is? Um, well, since my house is empty, I haven't got one now. <laughs> Um, I think I think probably at this moment in time we've just discovered in in my mum's loft a Bible that goes right back to the marriage of my great great grandfather, eighteen something, and at the moment I think that's probably going to be the thing that's going to be my most prized. Oh, that's lovely, lovely. Thank you, Hilary. I'm sure we'd have, we, I obviously want to send lots of love to your mum too. Oh, bless you. So thank you. Bless thank you. you. Yes, and all thank the fans as well. Thank right. you. Vicky Rose is in Derbyshire. Good afternoon, Vicky. Hello. It's your line. Hi, Vicky. Thank you. Hello, Cliff. Hi. Um, first of all, congratulations on 40 years in the business. Thank you. Um, when the concerts are over, what can we look forward to next, or will you be taking a rest? Um, well, don't forget that the concerts won't be over really till March next year because the tickets sold quite well the first time. So we managed to get 12 extra nights in March next year. So how many nights is that all together? The It'll be 32. Yeah. Filling the Albert Hall, 32 nights. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh. Eric, well, Eric Clapton does it. Amazing. I Fantastic. think Eric Eric Clapton actually has the record. Has he? Yeah. Well, I think that's amazing, Vicky. Don't you? Oh, it's a marvellous. Wonderful. So they'll not end until March, and then Vicky wants to know. Well, then I'll have is. a bit of a gap, I think, and uh, and and I'm hoping we're planning at the moment the possibility. We're, we're looking at the possibility of doing a sort of show that will lead us to the millennium, a really massive production, and we've seen a set design which works really well. But it's a matter of finding theatres. It's kind of late to figure out, you know, what to do for the millennium, and that'll take me through till March, 2000. That'll do. Vicky, I take it you'll be going to the Albert Hall, will you? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Oh, good. Already. Good. Yes. Good. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Now to Bolton and it's Christine Munro. How are you, Christine? All right, thanks. And Cliff is all yours, just for a moment. Hi, Christine. Hi, Cliff. I'd just like to wish you uh, congratulations on 40 years in show business. Thank you. I'd just like to ask you, have you got any plans for the future to do another musical? Well, I can't say I've got any plans, lots of ambitions to do something, so I'm just hoping that somebody will say, oh yeah, I saw Heathcliff and we'd like to produce a show with Cliff in it, and then um, I'll be open and up for grabs. But you loved doing the musical, didn't you? Oh, I think if I didn't do anything else, if my career ended tomorrow, I feel I, I would have, I'd have peaked. I mean, I just thought the combination of the thing, I've loved to sing for years and been dabbling with drama and to bring them together was just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. I loved every second of it. Well, Christine, no doubt you'll be at the Albert Hall as well. So. Oh, yeah, I enjoyed Heathcliff. I thought it was absolutely great. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And I just, I just say that I, I met you in London when you was in Oxford Street because I don't live in London now. I've moved up to Bolton now. Oh, tough and luck. And you signed my LP for me um, <laughs> uh, from the event. So oh, that's really? your prize possession yes. then. <laughs> All right, oh, I'll give my, my love to Bolton. 
Yes, I will. Bye bye. Thanks. And to Buckinghamshire to Deidre Cairns. Hi, Deidre. Hi there, Gloria. And what's your question for Cliff? Uh, hi, Cliff. Hi. Um, I'm coming to see you next Monday at the Royal Albert Hall. Looking forward to it. And uh, I met you at Heathcliff. I had a shirt on that you thought was yours, but it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> it was a musical one. Uh, well, this is an interesting call. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to ask you was, um, who taught you to sing? Well, nobody taught me to sing, other than I could say, of course, the Everly Brothers, Elvis, Little Richard, Buddy Holly. They're the people that were around when I was in my uh, mid-teens, and so therefore I guess they were the teachers. I didn't have any official training, um, although I did have some trouble with my voice about three or four years ago. Yes, and, I, I know. And so I got somebody in who could help me try to learn how to breathe again properly, and, and I still have a tape that's that he, John Asquith did for me, and I use it as a warm-up now, and it's been a big help before the show to actually warm up those little muscles that are in there. Well, I guess after 40 years of singing, you do have to look after it every so often. <laughs> you do, I'm afraid. Keep on, keep on going, because it's really terrific. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Thank Deirdre, you very much. thanks a lot, and thank enjoy the concert. Thank you very much. And thank just a quick call, uh, two, two callers the same. Uh, in fact, I think that the audience left a question. Is Marion from London and Sandra from Hornchurch? Yes, they're in our audience somewhere. And they say that you've done lots of duets, but is there anyone else you admire in particular that you'd like to sing with? Oh, that's a really difficult one to answer because there's so many people. You hear a record like by Celine Dion or, or you hear, I love the combination of Celine and the Bee Gees. Now, both of those people would be nice to, rather nice to record with. And there's my favorite people like Bonnie Raitt, who's one of the best slide guitarist but a terrific singer yeah she's got a real rough voice oh time, yeah wonderful she? boz skaggs i mean he's somebody that we should hear on the radio here but we you know there are some of the you know radio two certainly plays it um but i'd like to hear more of him and i'd love to make a record with him excellent well thank you for those calls and as i promised earlier we are now going to give three people the chance of winning an exclusive set of cliff richard goodies now we have first of all a box set of his rock and roll years albums the, the years from let's just read it 58, 58 to 63. 63. It's a great set, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think it is. It's a very <laughs> nice package. But it is, it is for the diehards. I mean, I'm sure if you're not really interested in what I've done in the years, you're not going to want it, really. <laughs> we also have a special promotional copy. Uh, this says it's promotional copy. Not on sale in the shops yet. This is of the brand new album. And as I say, you can't buy it in the shops, but you can get it in open house. And we have a personally signed photograph, and we have the promotional copy of the new single as well. Lots of goodies. So all you have to do is to answer this very difficult question correctly. Now, at which major sporting event did Cliff sing to entertain the crowd during a downpour? Was it A, the World Cup of 1966? Was it B, Wimbledon of 96? Or was it C, Euro of 96? And if you know the answer, no audience, please contain yourself. No help, please. If you know the answer, the number to ring is 0891. 555360. That's 0891 555 The calls cost a minimum, a maximum, by the way, of 25p. And if you're under 16, ask permission if you don't pay the phone bill. Now, here's the point. I want to tell you the winners will be selected at random from people with the right answer. And the lines are open until midnight tomorrow. And the three winners will be announced on Wednesday, so make sure you're with us. This is the magic moment. We've all been waiting for it here in the house because it's time to hear the voice that has sold over 250 million records. Here now with the title track from his latest album, Who Else Could It Be? It is Cliff Richard and Real As I Want To Be.
And I'm not so long of back, and no one can catch me. I'm as real as I'm gonna be. I'm back in nothing but that which belongs to me. My heart and my soul, and the pieces of a dream. I'm gonna make that dream. Go on holiday, will you do my depth job for me? I will, I will. I'll do the cooking Fantastic. as well. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Tomorrow, Brian Blessed is on the programme. We'll see you at 2.30. In the meantime, thanks for your company today. Have a wonderful afternoon. And thanks, of course, to Sir Cliff Richards. <laughs>